partial aspect of what we're talking about. But first, could I say that I entirely thank you. I entirely agree with Dr. Leverett that the, um, there should be no problem of, about an independent Scotland becoming a member state of the EU. That said, I don't think that those who talk about it entirely take account of what terms might be offered or what terms might have to be negotiated for membership. My view is that it is not obvious that Scotland would, if it were independent, on the assumption that the rest of the UK is a continuing state and therefore entitled to continue to enjoy all the privileges and uh, advantages which it, it, it enjoys at the moment, in particular the budget rebate and the various opt-outs, it's not obvious to me that Scotland would be entitled, as the Scottish Government claim, to enjoy the same rebate in respect of the budget and the same opt-outs. At any rate, put it this way, Scotland would have to negotiate that. And I don't, uh, I don't think that uh, the outcome of those negotiations is obvious. A further point which I think I would certainly have to take issue with the, uh, the Scottish government's position is that I don't think it is remotely possible to have all the negotiations settled and in place by March of 2016, as the Scottish government say. And therefore, well, let, let me say this. The question of Greenland partly opting out in the sense that it remains part of the customs union, although not part of the Kingdom of Denmark for all other purposes as an EU member state, that negotiation took two years. The treaty, uh, Article 50, which Dr. Leverett referred to, envisages if a member state wishes to leave in order that the future relationship of that member state with the EU and its member states should be settled for the future, then it, a period of two years is envisaged. So I would question whether it is conceivably possible that uh, Scotland could be a, independent, and B, immediately on independence, a full member state of the EU on or before March 2016. I think it is just not conceivably possible. And of course, one of the political considerations in that event is the fact that there are elections for the Scottish Parliament in May, I think of 2016. So it's not uh, at all obvious what then happens if by any chance the Scottish National Party loses its majority in the Scottish Parliament uh, and even more so if the Scottish National uh, the 
another party, a unionist party, becomes the majority party or is a coalition of unionist parties which have a majority, as at May 2016, then it, I think things could become, for those who are um, what are called anoraks in this uh, field, for the anoraks, the scene would be very interesting indeed. For the rest of us, I think um, ext extremely frustrating. Incidentally, um, I, I have been referred to in England as a poster child for the First Minister's position, and I wish to make it absolutely clear that I am a fervent no voter, and I have made that perfectly clear, and the First Minister knows that, but he still uses me as justifying his position. So let me make that clear. Now the question which is put to me is, in what ways can EU institutions adapt to facilitate the entry of Scotland and Catalonia into the EU in the event of a vote for independence without exclusion? Could these reforms be tied to broader EU institutional reforms desired by the UK and other member states? First of all, the conjunction of Scotland and Catalonia, I think, requires some explanation. The situation as regards Scotland is that the Edinburgh Agreement, signed by the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the First Minister of Scotland, envisages that if there is a yes vote in September, then Scotland will or can proceed to independence. That is to say that it is constitutionally proper and constitutionally po possible for Scotland to become independent. The situation as regards Catalonia is quite different because the government of Spain and indeed the uh, Supreme Court of Spain as well as, other, as well as other national institutions of Spain say that secession of Catalonia is constitutionally impossible. Spain is uh, one entity which cannot be broken up. It is true that Spain has a rather complicated form of federal structure and that the what are called the autonomous communities have the possibility within limits to se settle their own form of government and their relationship with the Spanish central state. But it, the authorities of Spain say it's not constitutionally possible for Catalonia to become, to separate itself from the rest of Spain. Now, the treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, the Treaty on European Union, says, amongst other things, that the Union shall respect the constitutional position of the member states. And therefore, I think it is, on the one hand, fully um, acceptable, as far as the treaties are concerned, uh, that there should be a constitutional separation between Scotland and the rest of UK. But it's not at all clear that the Union could recognize Catalonia if it um, declared itself to be independent of Spain, if Spain as the member state claimed that that separation was unconstitutional. At any rate, I think you have to separate the two 
cases because they're not in that respect the same. Second thing, um, the question is in what ways can the EU institutions adapt to facilitate the entry of Scotland and Catalonia? The question is, I think, or, or rather it has to be said, that the only adaptation which involves both the institutions and the member states is that they have to accept that a, an existing member state splits into two or more parts and that each part remains fully a member of the EU. If, the, if, if that is acceptable, then it, any adaptation of the institutions as such would be limited to acceptance of uh, Scotland mentioned in the treaty as a new member state that the, there would be a Scottish commissioner, there would be a Scottish judge in the Court of Justice, that Scotland, the whatever it, it might be called, but assume the first minister of Scotland would become a member of the European Council and so on. So adaptation, not so much. It, in order to um, accept or uh, integrate an independent Scotland in the EU. For myself, I think the more interesting question is what happens if Scotland votes no, because my own personal view is that Scotland, that the institutions of the EU have not fully taken on board the significance of the changes in the treaties made by the Treaty of Lisbon. The Treaty of Lisbon, for the first time, fully recognizes the national parliaments. That is to say the parliaments at national level of the member states as full actors, if you put it that way, in the uh, working of the, Euro the European legislative and other systems. The national parliaments are given the power to, um, as it is said, to uh, hold up a yellow card to proposed legislation. And one of the interesting features of that particular provision is that it is not just the parliaments as such, but each chamber of the parliaments that has a role here. Now the significance of that is not uh, very difficult to understand if we imagine, if we're talking about the United Kingdom as presently constituted, but if you're talking about the Federal Republic of Germany, the chamber, the other second chamber of the Federal Republic, the Bundesrat, is composed of representatives of the constituent lender. And therefore, the Lisbon system of giving rights not just to parliaments but to chambers of parliaments recognizes the possibility that a chamber representing the regions or cons perhaps uh, more properly it would be said consisting of representatives of the regions can actually play an active part in the in the machinery 
of legislation, the machinery of government of the EU. Now, that, in addition to that, the treaty now says that in doing so, there is an obligation on the national parliaments to consult regional parliaments with legislative powers. Now, quite how that is to uh, operate is not clear, but it does mean that the um, uh, regional parliaments are recognized as having some role to play in this system. Now, from my, from my point of view, that is a very fundamental difference in the uh, conception and structure of the European Union. The up to now, or up to li the coming into force of Lisbon, the, um, the institutions of the Union have been able to work on the assumption that the actors in the Union are at the level of the member states and not below that level, below the level of the institutions of the member states. As far as the, the union is concerned and the way the, uh, it operates through the court of justice, as far as the union is concerned, the member states are the actors the member states are responsible for ensuring compliance with all the rules of the EU by their own institutions and by any subordinate institutions in their regions. So the United Kingdom is responsible vis-a-vis -vis the Court of Justice for what is done by the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government and indeed by any local authority. So there is a, a difference there in that for the first time, the treaties, so to speak, look below the level of the member states and they introduce the idea that the national parliaments are actors and that the national parliaments have some responsibility vis-a-vis the reg uh, regional parliaments with legislative powers. There is an institution, and this is, uh, provis uh, provision is made for it in the treaty, the Committee of the Regions. The Committee of the Regions was originally intended to be a body representing regional entities because it was felt that the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers did not adequately represent the regions. The problem with the Committee of the Regions is that um, it was constituted on a basis which the German Constitutional Court has said is over-federalization. Every member state had to have representatives in the Committee of the Regions. So Luxembourg, which is, has a population, total population, the same as Edinburgh, has represent, representatives in the Committee of the Regions. And Malta, has six members of the Committee of the Regions and Catalonia has three. Now that really means that the Committee of the Regions cannot possibly be taken seriously as a representative of the regional entities with legislative and other uh, governmental powers. There is provision in the treaty, in the Lisbon Treaty, for the Committee of the Regions to go to the Court of Justice to complain of anything 
which uh, affects its status as a committee. But unfortunately, there is nothing in the treaty which really um, adjusts its constitution to the reality of regionalism in the EU. And that, I think, is the problem that the institutions of the EU have to face up to. You cannot, as I see it, continue to um, have, uh, insist on the pretense that a, a body which uh, enables Malta to have six members and Catalonia to have three to be a serious representative of the regions in the process of government. And sooner or later, that has got to be faced up to. Now, it's, having said that, it is also important to take up the fact that the, there are a very large number of regions in the EU which have Whose, uh, whose parliaments or uh, assemblies have legislative powers. Let me just find what the numbers are. There is a conference of specialized organs of community affairs called COSAC, and there are also REG-LEG, regional legislatures, and a conference of, Europe, um, of regional legislative assemblies, where the assemblies are represented by their presidents or speakers. There are 73 regions in Regledge and 74 in Calry. So you have to face up to the fact that even if, or rather if you say that the Committee of the Regions isn't properly representative of regions with legislative powers, then you have to ask, well, what else can you have? And then you see that you've got potentially a body with 74 or three or four members. The, the possibility of recognizing the variety of governmental situations within the union, I think is important and the Lisbon Treaty has taken the first step in that direction. But it does seem to me that if uh, the union, uh, if, if you're not going to sit, find a situation in which uh, you have a separation of parts of the United Kingdom, and it's not self-evident that if Scotland separates from the rest of the United Kingdom, there will not be further separations. It is on the cards that, the, that Belgium will separate into two states, and it is on the cards that in some fashion, Catalonia will separate from the rest of Spain. If you are going, to, if, if it is part of the politic of the European Union to prevent such things happening, then it seems to me that the politic of the EU has to be, has to look towards institutional mechanisms to avoid it. For myself, I think the position adopted by uh, 
President Barroso of the Commission in which he, ha he chose to say that uh, independent Scotland as an EU member state was highly, very difficult, if not impossible, is not just absurd as a matter of law, but absurd as a matter of politics. You cannot have a situation in which the institutions of the Union treat the regions, if you like, of the Union in that way. So it does seem to me that on the assumption even well, let me put it this way. Let us suppose Scotland votes yes. Let us suppose that the uh, Union finds a way in which Scotland becomes a member state as from the moment of independence. Nevertheless, it seems to me that the institutions of the Union have to find ways to recognize the legitimate interests of the regions of Europe. Europe is too large to work well in a situation where you have five very large member states and then a whole lot of small member states and creating a, and refusing to accept that the regions of the large member states have any autonomous interest in the working of the Union. So subject to any questions anyone would like to ask, that's my assessment of it. 